morning, church family. I'm glad that uh, you chose to worship our Lord with us this morning to be here and to sing, hear from his word, to sing his praises. It's wonderful to see you here this morning. And for those that are joining us, um, it's always good to be in the house of the Lord. <clears throat> so this week we have Thanksgiving. And so I was thinking about, uh, you know, the, the season that we're in. <clears throat> And it's been kind of a rough year. Uh, I was earlier this morning with the first service, I was mentioning, you know, beginning of this year, we we're kind of wondering where our next roll of toilet paper comes from. And now we're towards the end of the year, and there's still things that uh, are uncertain. And uh, it might be a little harder this year to find Thanksgiving, but you know what? There is always a good time to thank the Lord. <clears throat> and so I thought of Psalm 100, which, of course, is pretty pretty um i'm gonna take this off for just a moment it's pretty uh famous i guess for the thanksgiving series uh season so i thought i'd read from that um psalm 100 verse 1 starts out says shout for joy to the lord all the earth serve the lord with gladness come before him with joyful songs know that the lord is god it is he who made us and we are his we are his people the sheep of his pasture Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. I hope you find that extremely encouraging, uh, just that part about shout to the Lord and always, in all seasons. And then it ends with the Lord is good and his love endures forever. We learned about that last week, that all things come, things fail things go away, but in the end, the Lord is good, and he loves us and, and, and endures forever. So um, praise the Lord for Thanksgiving, and praise the Lord throughout the year, <clears throat> no matter what. And so Thanksgiving season is here, as we were mentioning, and so we see on the slide here that there is the community uh, Thanksgiving that's being served uh, actually here at this church to, uh, to drive up. Um, and, uh, reservations are needed, and if you would so desire uh, to make that reservation with Brooke, her contact information is there. And uh, also, it looks like we're still needing some donations. Is that correct? Uh, okay. Okay. Okay, well, I was just, yes, contact Brooke if you would be felt, so felt led to um, provide. Okay. So also, um, we are looking for a, a member or candidates to um, be a, a part of the pastoral search committee. This is in regards to the pastor of youth and fi uh, family ministries. If you're interested in that, please let a committee member know uh, by noon next Saturday, and we will ho hope to have a, a ballot put together and a vote next Sunday for a member to um, fill uh, a vacated position on that committee. <clears throat> Christmas is around the corner also, um, so there's a few boxes I see in the back there, and if you have an would like to uh, partake in that, um, that ministry to give a child um, some toys and some, um, th something to, be, to look forward to for at Christmas time, and really ultimately to point them to Christ, um, put, those, put those boxes together, and we need them back by noon tomorrow. <clears throat> Is that where we intended to go? Can we back up? <laughs> One more? <clears throat> so there's a Christmas program that's coming up. So hopefully uh, your children are able to come and part to practice. Uh, that's happening during the jam session. And that's uh, going on now. And then the, the actual time in which we will have that Christmas program will be on December 13th. And uh, there's going to be a potluck afterwards. So I uh, look forward to that and seeing the kids um, sing and whatever it is that they do for the Christmas program. Look forward to that. <clears throat> okay. And Awana, a uh, wonderful ministry that we have going on at the church. It's been very, very fruitful. And, uh, and uh, if you are interested in having your child come to that, there's uh, opportunity for that. I believe this Wednesday there's no Awana. That's correct because of the Thanksgiving holiday. And so uh, get your, get, you know, if you can, bring your children in. I don't know this for sure. I'm going on a little uh, limb here, but I'm, I'm willing to bet that there's probably a need for help. 
And so if there is, you can let Brooke Henders or Brooke Bonzi know that, um, that you're interested in that. Okay? And then, of course, uh, uh, we have, a, there's a, for your ties and gifts, uh, that can be done electronically, or, of course, you could mail it in, or there's actually a, I guess I'll call it a container out in the foyer that you, if you want to drop a check into. Okay? And so for missionaries this month, we have Tim and Nicole Fox. Uh, they are uh, reside in the state of North Carolina. Uh, uh, Tim works for JARS. It's an aviation uh, service that brings uh, you know, ma uh, the gospel into other parts of the world. And so they are asking for prayer uh, during this upcoming season, the cold and flu season, and just asking for uh, continued good health that they are, um, have that. Okay, fighter verse. We're reading from Psalm 84, so if you wouldn't, if you would uh, stand up, please, in reverence to the Lord and his word, and we will read this together. <clears throat> Psalm 84, 10 through 12 says, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God said... On time. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he thou from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in him. Okay? You may be seated. And let's look to the word, or to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come before you um, this morning and we are grateful to be here in your house, um, this body of believers that you've established in this community. Lord, we thank you for your son Jesus and the, what he means to, to all of us and can mean to others that accept that gift of salvation. Lord, we, as we read in Psalm 100, we are to shout to you. We are to give thanksgiving into your courts with praise. Lord, we know your love, your love for us does not end. Your word is very clear on this. And Lord, we see it. We see it in your word. We see it in our lives. We see it in others. <clears throat> Lord, I pray that we always look to you for guidance and wisdom, that you bring us together as a body of believers who look to you to do your will, to bring good, the good news of the gospel and to, um, into our homes, our workplaces, our, to our neighbors and to our community and beyond, Lord. Lord, it is a Thanksgiving service, uh, season, and we have much to be thankful for. Um, Lord, um, even in times of trial, there are times or opportunities to praise you. And we want to do that always. <clears throat> Lord, we want to lift up those in our, in our midst that are hurting in one way or another, whether it be a physical need and an emotional need spiritually, Lord. Lord, we lift those, uh, up, uh, those folks up to you. All of us need you in some capacity and have a, a desire and a need to know you better. So, Lord, help, uh, give us strength. Give us the passion to care for one another. Unify us, Lord. Bring us together so that they, uh, those outside would know us by our love. Lord, we want to lift up specifically Tim and Nicole Fox and their work that they're doing in the mission field. Please protect them. Please protect them from health, uh, issues of, that, uh, of health. Uh, protect them from the evil one who would like to see their their ministry destroyed. So, Lord, just put that hedge of protection around them. Keep them safe. We thank you for your word. We look forward to hearing um, from Sam and what you've laid on his heart. Work through him. Uh, let his tongue repeat the words that you have put on his heart. <clears throat> And so, Lord, just uh, be with us this morning as we go look into your word, and later as we praise, your, um, praise you through song. And it's in your son's wonderful name that we pray. Amen. Okay. We have Sam with us this morning. He's going to bring us a message in the book of Philippians. So welcome, Sam. <clears throat>
How about that? Whoa, there it is. Yeah. Still getting used to this thing. Yeah, I think that's better. Yes, uh, it is a privilege to be able to to come and minister and see you folks. And as we begin, let's pause once again in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, as we approach your word, we know that there are so many, many thoughts, concerns, valid, each one, yet they could be used to distract us from hearing from you through your word right now. And so I pray that you would focus our hearts and minds through your spirit on what you would teach us today from your word. And that we would not take this as an exercise in information, but in transformation. That we would open our hearts to that work of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. She was born in 1913. Her mother's name was Eleanor Porter. Her missionary parents died when she was a preteen, so she was sent to live with her wealthy but stern aunt in a town populated by grumpy, sour people. Her story is how that town was transformed by something she called the glad game. Now, did I mention that she was born at age 12? For she is a fictional character known as Pollyanna. And the book by that name was written in 1913 by Eleanor Porter. This popular story has been made into movies, first in 1917 with Helen Hayes playing the little girl, then in 1920, Mary Pickford played Pollyanna long, long before Disney's 1960s version with Haley Mills. The glad game, if you're familiar with the story, is when you look at a disappointing situation and find a reason to be glad about it. When Pollyanna was on the mission field with her parents, the barrels of supplies arrived. She was hoping for a doll, but instead received crutches. How could you be glad about crutches? Well, they were glad because no one needed them. Over the years, people have ridiculed such thinking so much that you could be called a Pollyanna. And of course, when they call you a Pollyanna, they mean somebody who denies how rotten things really are and lives in some false reality. Indeed, if you've ever been around someone very long who's always looking on the bright side, it can get kind of annoying. <laughs> but before dismissing this perspective, consider what Scripture has to say about our life, our problems that we encounter. In God's Word, we're introduced to one individual whose attitude and behavior are right in line with this positive outlook. In one letter, he's so upbeat in the face of dire circumstances that his readers must have wondered if he was living in a false reality. He's the other Pollyanna, P-A-U-L, Pollyanna, Paul of Tarsus. Always looked on the bright side, even in prison, which is where he was when he wrote this letter that we call Philippians. Listen to just a few verses. Now, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. His imprisonment. This is actually a good thing. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and everyone else that I am here in chains for Christ because of my chains, because of my chains. Most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God courageously and fearlessly. It is true, some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am here in the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, 
not sincerely, supposing they can stir up some trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is, in every way, whether false motives are true, Christ is preached, and for this I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice. Then, over in chapter 2, he was facing a, a death sentence hanging over. At any moment, he could have been executed. And so he brings that up and says, you know, even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. In these four little chapters, he uses the word joy six times, rejoice eight times, and glad three times. In fact, joy of the Lord is really the unifying theme of this book. So if you have your GPS, please take it and turn to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to be jumping around, but I want to begin with chapter 4. I call God's Word a GPS because in passages like Psalm 25, 4 and 5, the psalmist asks God to direct me, guide me, lead me through His Word. GPS, God positioning system. I want to begin at verse 4 here in Philippians 4 and read through verse 13. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard in me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you've been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Is he suggesting the denial of reality? No, he realizes that thanksgiving, true thanksgiving, flows from the joy of the Lord. When the joy of the Lord fills our hearts, then thanksgiving is a natural result. He's suggesting that we focus on a better reality, a perspective that's too often neglected. And it goes like this. God is in control. I think we'd all agree to that. He has a plan. I can't see the big picture, the entire plan. But whether I understand it completely or not, he can be trusted, so I will praise and thank him with joy. In this book, Paul reveals three factors that determine our joy. And it's imperative that we understand these factors since our thanksgiving flows from that joy. And the first factor is the heart. The heart. Here in verses 4 through 7. What kind of heart has joy? Well, Paul would suggest that first of all, it's an unselfish heart. An unselfish heart is going to have joy. Back in chapter 1, at the opening of this letter, in verse 3 says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And down in verse 21, he continues, For me to live as Christ and to die as gain, if I am to go on living in the body, this means fruitful labor for me. Yet, what should I choose? I do not know. 
Sometimes I read that verse, I'm like, seriously, Paul? You don't know whether you want to live or be with Christ? I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body because he's able to minister to them. Paul, though in difficult circumstances, expresses his love and concern for these fellow believers. That's an unselfish heart. And it wells up with joy and expresses it thanks to God for them. An unselfish heart has joy. But also a trusting heart. Back in chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In order to have guarded hearts, we must trust God. Instead of worry or doubt, we cast our cares upon Him. Psalm 13, 5 says, I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. There's only about six verses in Psalm 13, and it is worthy of memorizing. If you think you're too old to memorize, that's okay. Just put it where you can read it often, because even by repetition of reading something, it will begin to sink in. But that psalm starts out with this question, How long, O Lord? Have you ever asked that question? In dark circumstances, how long is this going to be? And most often we're not told. The Lord doesn't say, five more minutes. No. Because he wants us to trust in him. The writer goes on to say, how long do I have to wrestle with my thoughts? I wrestled a little bit, not very much, about that much in high school. Mostly because my brother was a good wrestler and he needed a sparring partner. And recruited me without my permission most of the time. Anyway... <laughs> You can imagine wrestling, you know, and how you're, but you're wrestling with your own thoughts. And sometimes they have a chokehold on you and they put you in a half Nelson and all this. How long will my enemies triumph over me? The psalmist asks, most likely David. But then he says, but I trust in you and your unfailing love. He never let those circumstances dictate his trust in God. I don't get this. I don't know how long this is for, but I trust you. I'm going to hold on tight. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I think Paul understood this. A trusting heart wells up with joy and expresses thanks to God. What is your heart like today? Is it unselfish? Is it trusting? Joy cannot be yours unless it is. There is a second factor, and that is the mind. Not only the heart, but the mind in verses 8 through 13. What kind of mind has joy? Paul suggests that it is a disciplined mind. We're to guard our mind. You want to guarantee that you never have joy? I can give you a simple, simple way to guarantee you will never, ever have a moment of joy. Take out a piece of paper and make a list Every person who has failed you, hurt you, or wronged you. Enlist every pet peeve, disappointment, injustice, or misfortune. And when you completed your list, just think about it all the time. Put it where you'll always be reminded of everything that's ever gone wrong, everybody that's ever hurt you, and just dwell on that and have it go over and over and over in your mind. And you will be robbed of joy. It's called stinking thinking in the psychological world. But if, on the other hand, you want joy and peace, it can be yours. But you must train your mind in order to have it. Isaiah 26, 3 says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed. That's the King James uh, word. Stayed on thee, steadfast, because he trusts in you. Paul's paraphrase of that would be here in verse 8 of Philippians 4. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if there is anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. 
New American Standard says, let your mind dwell on those things. That's where you're going to camp out. On what is true, what is noble, what is right, pure, lovely, praiseworthy. It's not the denial of negative things. It's that these things are more worthy of our attention. We don't let negative thoughts take a foothold. Or as Paul said to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 10.5, bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That's a disciplined mind. And it wells up with joy and expresses thanks to God. But not only a disciplined mind, also a content in mind. Verses 11 and 12. I'm not saying this because I am in need. I have learned to be content with whatever the circumstances I know what it's like to be in need. I know what it's like to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being contempt. So he's got a little secret for us. I would say that this is the world's best kept secret. You know, it's hard to keep a secret. Right, kids? <laughs> Boy, as soon as somebody says, hey, I got to tell you a secret. Even before you hear the secret, you're already playing on who you're going to tell the secret to. <laughs> well, this secret doesn't seem to be getting around very well. The secret of contentment. He wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. The writer of Hebrews echoed that. Keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. Why? Because God said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Those things are going to be covered. No need to worry. No need to be discontented. Have you learned that secret? A contented mind wells up with joy and expresses thanks to God. What is your mind like today? Is it disciplined? Is it contented? Joy cannot be yours unless it is. There is a third and final factor. The heart, the mind, but also the spirit. The spirit. What kind of spirit has joy? Well, Paul would suggest that first of all, it is a fervent spirit. If you look back in chapter 3, Paul gives his sort of pedigree before Christ, what he was like. And then sums up in verse 7, But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom, whose sake I have lost all things, and consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, a righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. Can you hear Paul's passion here? The surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. Don't ever take that for granted. If your goal in life is something other than knowing Christ, you will be unfulfilled and very disappointed. Even if you're active in the church and church activities, Paul was. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was moving on up. But nothing can ever fill the place that Jesus is to have in our life. This is what was missing in Paul's life. Though religious, he now says, I consider it rubbish, a heap of dung. Everything. Everything is... Boy, what, is, what was he including in that? Everything is lost compared to knowing Christ. Wow. That's pretty inclusive. Fervent spirit wells up with joy and expresses thanks to God. But not just a fervent spirit. Paul would also suggest a focused spirit. Continuing on in verse 12, chapter 3. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself having taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which Christ, which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. One thing I do, that's focused. 
Is your spirit focused on that one thing? Do all other pursuits pale by comparison to knowing Christ? Straining, reaching, pursuing that one thing. Focused spirit, of course, then wells up with joy and expresses thanks to God. What is your spirit like today? Is it fervent? Is it focused? Joy cannot be yours unless it is. And have you noticed that none of these factors are external? None of them. The heart, the mind, the spirit, it's all internal. So what's going on outside is irrelevant. Joy isn't based on what's going on around us. Look at Paul. Prison, people, persecution, problems, places, none of this stopped his joy. If that were the case, Paul would have been the most miserable person he had every reason in the world to be sour in fact he gives us a glimpse of it. if you want to keep your place there and turn to second corinthians when he was writing to these believers in corinth he they were questioning his apostleship his credentials sort of and so he said you know if you want to play that game okay i'll play that game and then he begins to detail some of the persecutions and troubles he went through he said he was out of his mind to talk like this it's in chapter 11, beginning at verse 23. Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this, but I am more. I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely. If you're going to sit down and compare your floggings. Been exposed to death. Again and again, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes, minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent the night and the day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger. Get this, this is pretty inclusive. Danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from countrymen, danger from Gentiles. That includes everybody on the planet. Danger in the city, danger in the country, danger at sea. Danger from false brothers. I've labored and toiled, often gone without sleep. I've known hunger, thirst, gone without food, been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I feel the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. Well, if he had reason, I mean, if there was a reason to be sour, Paul could have had it. But he chose something else. How did he avoid falling into that trap? Well, we get two glimpses. One is also in earlier in 2 Corinthians in chapter 4, verse 11. He says, Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Light and momentary troubles. Boy, we don't have to think too far back in this year that's finally ending and say, wow, yeah, we had some troubles this year. And I don't make light of anybody's difficulties, but can you say they are momentary? Well, if you have a perspective on eternity, you can. Then in Romans 8.18, he said, I consider our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. It's not even worth comparing you say, well, can't people and circumstances bring us joy? Of course they can, and they do many times. But that's icing on the cake. The true test is when we have joy regardless of our surroundings, in the midst of the storm that's swirling around us. You want an example of that? Here's one. On May 27th, 2001, a missionary couple, Martin and Gracia Burnham, were kidnapped in the Philippines and held for ransom by Muslim terrorists. For just over a year, they were herded from one jungle camp and hideout to another. Each night, Martin was chained to a tree to prevent his escape. During that year, the fleeing terrorists exchanged gunfire on 13 occasions with the Philippine military. The Burnhams knew it was only by the hand of God that they would be released. On June 7, 2002, a year and 11 days from the time they were taken hostage, their captors interrupted the march for a break. 
They'd been hiking all day, so they strung up the hammock to rest. Martin said, it's been a very hard year. Is that not the understatement? <laughs> you think? They said, it's also been a very good year. Like, wait, what are you talking about? A good year? Separated from your children? Facing, the, what are you saying? Then they began to thank the Lord for everything they could think of. They made a list. We thank the Lord for our hammock. We thank the Lord for our boots. They thank God for every believer they'd ever met. They could remember God had encouraged their hearts with the thought that that person, couple, family, or church were probably praying for them. The Lord brought Psalm 100, verse 2, we had it earlier, to Martin's mind, which reads, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. The other hostages said that Martin and Gracia sang often. Martin said, we might not leave this jungle alive, but at least we can leave this world serving the Lord with gladness. Gladness. And we can serve him right here where we are and with gladness. The last thing they did was to pray, thanking God for his faithfulness, and they lay down for a nap. They were awakened by gunfire between the terrorists and the Philippine scout rangers. Martin was ushered into the Lord's presence. A grace of the wounded was rescued. At the time the news of the Burnham's rescue broke, I was very discouraged by some circumstances. And the Lord used their dire situation to convict me. You know, sometimes the Lord whispers, and sometimes he used a baseball bat. And he used a baseball bat. How could I feel sorry for myself? How could I lament over my hardships? How could I be sour if these who had gone virtually through hell could commit themselves to serve the Lord with gladness? From that time on, I prayed for joy and for gladness of heart and mind and spirit. And God graciously granted it, I must say. So much so that I was chided by one person for being so happy. What are you so happy about, Sam? And by the way, my circumstances did not improve. They got worse. But through it all, God sustained me. You see, joy can't be taken away because God's love cannot be separated from us. He loves me. Nothing's going to separate us from his love. Romans chapter 8. Again, Paul, Pollyanna, <laughs> wrote this. These are familiar verses. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? rhetorical question then he suggests shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written for your sake we face death all day long we're considered as sheep to be slaughtered no in all these things we're more than conquerors through him who loved us for I'm convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons neither the present or the future or nor powers, nor height, or depth, or anything in all creation is able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When you latch on to that, you have an entirely different perspective on, on circumstances. And you can live in a realm that, it, that transcends those things. Are you ready for the glad game? I must tell you, it's not a game. It's for keeps. And your joy and your thanksgiving will depend upon it. And if you're listening to all this and saying, yeah, that sounds nice, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's happening. How can I know this is a reality? Well, it's verse 13, back in Philippians 4. Often quoted, put on 
cross stitch. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Yeah, you will not do this in your own strength. If you're going to try that, prepare to do a face plant in the dirt. But through Christ, because we're focused on him, it can be a reality. And it can be yours. And it can be yours starting right now. Let's pray. Father, none of us, none of us here today are going to deny that this, this planet can really, really bother us. That there are so many things that put us in a tailspin. And there'll never, ever, ever be a shortage of those things. And yet you provide the antidote for all that. When our focus is on you. That when our heart and our mind and our spirit are pursuing Jesus Christ, it just puts everything else in perspective. And we have his example, Jesus Christ, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame. And we can have that same vision To see beyond the difficulties to that eternal weight of glory. Father, help us. Help us to, first of all, make that choice daily, moment by moment if necessary, to choose Jesus in joy over the world and its frets and worries. Help us surrender to you. In, in Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sam. <clears throat> Let me flip to the uh, call to worship. There we go. Perfect. Our call to worship here this morning uh, comes from Psalm. Like many calls to worship do. Um, this one is from chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. It says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exalt you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. So the, this walkthrough of Philippians is fantastic um, in this time of Thanksgiving. Um, and this, this week being Thanksgiving, but what, well, let's just say that you know, every, every week can't be Thanksgiving. Um, when we uh, count everything as joy, as, as, as Paul said in, in, in Philippians. Um, just a fantastic message about that. There's really only one way to do that um, in, in dire situations and everything, and that's, uh, that's a full surrender. Um, and that, that can only be born out of love. This, this is a new song um, here this morning, because why not? Um, but this is, this is called Everything or Nothing. Uh, if you'll stand, if you need to listen to this one um, to kind of get the feel for it, please go ahead and do that. Otherwise, um, join in when you feel comfortable. But pay attention to a lot of the words of this one because this is very important during this, uh, this time of Thanksgiving. everything or nothing at all it's an open heart or a stone wall it's all in or it's all out love is everything i don't want to reach the end of the day and wonder how our time slipped away I'm learning what it means to say love is everything. I will give you my all. There's no hiding in the middle ground. Either fly or we fall. Love 
my attention, oh, I hear you now. I surrender, I surrender, cause it's everything or nothing at all. I surrender, I surrender, cause it's everything or nothing at all. It's easier to stay in the lines And play it safe, you know we'd all be fine But I hear you whisper one more time Love is everything I will give you my all There's no hiding in the middle ground Either fly or we fall have my attention, oh, I hear you now. I surrender, I surrender, cause it's everything or nothing at all. I surrender, I surrender, cause it's everything or nothing at all. greater love has ever been than the one who gave it all for a friend lord help me never to forget love is everything i will give you my all there's no hiding in the middle ground either fly or we fall have my attention, oh, I hear you now. I surrender, I surrender, cause it's everything or nothing at all. I surrender, I surrender, cause it's everything or nothing at all. I surrender, I surrender, Cause it's everything or nothing at all I surrender, I surrender Cause it's everything or nothing at all I hear the Savior say Thy strength indeed is small Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He was it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power in thine alone can change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. my 
my dead and praise this life up from the dead oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the grave oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the grave
Oh, the rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor unto thee. Sent of heaven, God's own Son, to purchase and redeem, and reconcile the very ones who nailed him to that tree. salvation where your love poured out over me now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor unto thee now my debt is paid it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. Now my debt is paid. It is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. Oh, the rugged my salvation where your love poured out over me now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor unto thee see the stone is rolled Behold the empty tomb. Hallelujah, God be praised. He's risen from the grave. Oh, the rocket cross, my salvation, where your love benediction comes from Romans chapter 15 5 through 6 uh, if you can read this with with us um, as we as we close here may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ amen